And the first question I've got for both of you is when you actually came to Whiting Bay. Isabel, you mentioned a story to me just outside a bit. I came as a student on my bike with four school friends in 1948. And when I was going into the post office before we left on the ferry from Whiting Bay, I met a friend of my mother's and she was renting Forest Alds house. So she had us up for something to eat. And because I had made the connection for my mother, really, we came back the following year. And a, I had a friend with me. And we came down to the hall here to the dance. There were four dances every week by a mainland band. And the other two nights, there were pictures, films. A man, Hamilton, who lived in the village, had the pictures. And a, it was a kind of grisly night. <laughs> And sitting, we had walked down from Dippin, sitting under the clock in the hall when this guy came across and asked me to dance, which I did. And then he asked me if I would go home with him, and I said, no, it was too early. And about three quarters of the way through the dance, he came back, but by then I discovered he had a car. So when he said, would I go home with him, I said, yes. So I got a lift back to first <laughs> That was the beginning. That was it. And then I came back the following year. I was at no school as a student and worked in Inver Invermay for two months um, in 1950, 49, 50. So that was the start of a long relationship. Yeah, about 61 years. 61 years, yeah. Lovely. So obviously um, we've got the the wedding photograph here. What that year were you 1953, married? 1953. And the um, telegrams that came, it was the year of the coronation. So the crown and the other things were at the top. And uh, there's, there's some out there. But um, that was in Cumnock, which is where I came from. And um, we moved into Sanbury's house, rented it, which was next door to your mm -hmm. gran and grandpa. And it was Spears Dick and Smith who had the yard at the back. Did you tell me at one stage that you worked it for Spears, Dick and Smith? Or no, no, I coffeed with the men coffee in your the grand and grandma's <laughs> when she was making scones with the gindle over the open fire. <laughs> and um, Spud Taylor, who's still in the Lash, he was one of the workmen, and your dad. And uh, the minister at that time had a cat. <laughs> it had had kittens in one of the sheds at the back. And your father wrote Sandbray's maternity home <laughs> over the door. My memories of your dad, yes. Knew him well. Thank you. Missy Perry, when did you move to Whiting Bay? Or? Well, uh, when I was a child, the only thing we associated with Whiting Bay was the festival. Because everybody came, you know, all the school people came. And there was great uh, enmity between the different choirs. And nearly every village had a cat samadhi choir and a village choir and uh, they're all competing you know and it was quite friendly but the whole island went to this thing but the, when i first came to visit whiting bay i had met jim perry uh, in the post office and he uh, invited me to go to the lifeboat ball we right. needed a partner for the that's ball that's so we went to the lifeboat ball and that uh, was the beginning history. <laughs> He's been dead for 18 years, so I didn't keep him alive. He was a bit older than myself, but uh, we got married in 1957, I think it was, the same year that the pier came down, or the pier closed, and uh, that was that. Uh, I still had it. My mother was still alive in Brodick, and my sister was working in Glasgow and with British Rail, but uh, that was all the first, my first visits to Whiting Bay. And uh, mother-in-law was quite a character. Which, uh, yes, I uh -huh. will just leave the subject to that. Uh, you could have called her more than that, but her heart was in the right place. For example, the day I passed my driving test, David, my son, ran to tell her. He was all excited. Mother could drive, and uh, she gave him five pounds, and that was a lot of money, 1957 or thereabouts. David was born, and he's now 58, so if you're better at sums than I am, You'll know that uh, we were married in 57 and he was married, born 
a year, a month, and a day later. And we didn't have to go off the island in these days. And doctor, old Dr. Buchanan said to me when the child was five minutes old, now don't make him an only child. I felt like saying it's all very well for you. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid I did let him be an only child. He was and a character, uh, Dr. Buchanan. He had one or two heart attacks, and then eventually one of them won. It used to be he would always come back, you know. So yeah. Dr. Buchanan... He travelled about the island, is that correct, and came to... He was Robert's father, Robert right. Buchanan's father. And he, he actually had a quite strong interest, interest in a, um, the maternity ward. He was a completely well, yes, different yes. character. Never lost another no, baby. No, completely years different years character. Years. They were frightened for him downstairs. He was quite, quite a difficult guy. But in the maternity ward, he was really quite, quite different. And... Um, he was there for, in fact, after he retired, they had difficulty keeping him away. It caused a bit of difficulty. So, you both stayed in White Bay for... Can I see? Yeah. We had another connection. Wilma was born in a place called Skaysgar Allen, outside Cumnock. Skaysgar. My, father My mother was, used to say, don't tell folk you're born in Skaysgar. My father was the headmaster there. And would she, have gone to the school. Uh -huh. She was in uh, the farm which was adjacent to Dad's school. And then, of course, when I came here, Jim was a great friend of Joe and myself before Wilma. Jim McLarty was the other one. Uh -huh. And Wilma and I each took cubs. I took them here yeah. and Wilma took them in Brodick. And when you went to that dance, Joe and I were going as well. But Joe's father was diagnosed that day with cancer. Oh yes, you had. You were called away, or you didn't get. Did you we, get to the dance? No, we didn't. No, go you didn't. Because the phone. Called. And Jim kept wondering why you hadn't That's turned right. up. Uh -huh. Because I was actually getting ready to go to the dance when we got the phone call, so we didn't go. And that was when Jim and Wilma got together. The best history. So you you mentioned that you had the. The cubs and was it uh, the scouts as well cubs, that you took? Yeah, I'm rather short on the hairline. The bucks, the bucks okay, here. What, yeah, it's off, it's the bucks, the twins. Yeah. I had them, and Colvin Hamilton. He was the picture man's son. Oh, Colvin! Oh, yes. When I had the cubs, he was laid back, wasn't he? The and nice boy. That's right. The other thing was uh, we had a dentist called Mr. Donald, who had retired here. I think he'd practiced in Africa. Africa. And yes. he was in the flat above the chemist in the lash, and I had gone for treatment. And my mouth was open, and the, as usual, it is it's quite a lot, mouth was open, and the instruments were in my mouth, and suddenly the voice said, have you been in the guides and the brownies, Isabel? And I said yes. And before I left the surgery, he had me taking the cubs. <laughs> These That's things happen. <laughs> That's how I got involved. Mrs. Perry, I heard you outside telling a story of when you were on the ferry and some of pupils you had taught oh, were yes, driving trucks. They said we should all listen to old Perry, <laughs> um, especially they... the boys who were going over to the continent, you know, because oh, I taught French. Uh -huh. They had to, to learn French and, and should was... have listened to you at school, yeah. Must have been, that's right. Who else was in your year? Um, there was Stuart Cook. Oh, yeah. Who? Stuart Cook. Oh, uh, Stuart Amy, Cook, yes. Uh, yes. I saw him in one of the photographs. Yeah, and Hugh Miller. Uh-huh. And we had Lannis Scott Miller. Scott I had, I think, not Hugh. Well, it might have been Hugh as well. Yes, because yeah. Hugh came once to France with us. Yeah. A school holiday, that's right. Yeah. Ah, so when did you start, start teaching at the high school? Well, wait a minute, 47, about 1950 or thereabouts. Uh-huh. I think it was 50. I didn't do quite the, the 50 years, 40 years. I was 39, I think. I had time off when David was born. And uh, that was the only time. Pope used to say, how long have you taught here? I would say, too long. <laughs> and I was calling Pope with her father's name or her mother's name. And the, one boy had gone home and said, she called me with the wrong name. He said, well, at least they knew what family you belonged to. We're on to the fourth generation of the pupils we had in school. Well, that's right. Taught, uh, great grannies and great <laughs> So was you, were you a teacher as well, Isabel? Did you? Well, they were looking for a home economics teacher when Betty Black left. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. uh -huh. And I got contacted to ask if I would go in and fill in until they got somebody. 
I hadn't actually gone to Jordan Hill to be taught to teach, but I'd done the three years in the Home Economics a College of Domestic Science. Oh yes, that's what it was called then. So I went in to help them out, and I was there for five years. Maybe you were learning to drive, and sometimes I sat with you. You drove me to. Well, did I? Uh -huh. And if you had a bad period at the end of the day, I got the brunt of it coming back to writing me. So you travelled together as yes, well, yeah? we did, yes. <laughs> well, the years go by, don't they? It's frightening. We're still around, though, to tell the story. Well, we're still alive, <laughs> but only just, just sometimes. <laughs> David and Jackie had to have their dog put down. I'm saying, that's what they'll have to do with me. <laughs> so the way they'll get rid of me. And of course, our house is on the market. And we've had five families looking at but nobody's put in an offer yet. That will happen someday. You think, what we're going to do with the money if we get it? We'll, uh, help, we'll help you to spend it. I would you help that as well? I'll remember that. It's a good offer. So the Miller family were involved, as I remember, in the butcher shop initially down the road. When I first met Joe, the family had bought St. Columbus along on the front, which had been a man's, and a girl's school at one time, at the far end. And well, St. Columbus, yes, yes uh huh. And um, that would be, what, 1949, 1950. And a, the father, Joe's father, died in 19, he was only 57. He died, in, he died in 1957, but the mother stayed on. And it was at the time um, Betty and Hugh got married shortly afterwards. And they had a house in the village up at Benview, but they moved into St. Columbus with his mother. Joe was involved and Hugh was involved in the business. And when the bank was selling, the building down at the jetty here. Um, they had it as a butcher shop. And then eventually Hugh wanted to get out of the business. So Joe built the shop opposite the school in Lamlash in 1986. And he carried on there till he retired and then Gillian took it over <coughs> at that stage. And do both of you have a, a favorite memory of White and Bay or some Something that no, there was just lots of and I suppose you were, you were involved. Uh, and I was in the church committee at one time, which was a tremendous committee. And we used to have barbecues and fashion shows from here through to the big hall. And there was a very nice dress shop, which is where Coast is now. And they were using the clothes from the dress shop, from Coast, the dress shop. Remember Babs Folly worked in Yes, it? yes. Well, I was helping Babs. And then when Marriott says, that was a Bobby Haddo and David a... Gosh. Warwick, is it? Yes, no, David no. Warwick. Oh, Warwick. And Bobby Haddo yes. bought it. And he a, died quite young, yes, Warwick, yes. didn't he? And a, it was a shop as well as the garage. And... A, Sam Chadwick, who came from Yorkshire, he actually did paintings of places on the island and sold them to visitors. That one I brought in at the pier was Sam Chadwick who did it. And then uh, the Marriott's came, I don't know, maybe in the 60s. And of course they took it over at that stage. David Warwick had died and Bobby Hadda was involved with, with other things. And a uh, well, there were lots of celebrations of different things, weren't there, mm -hmm. through the, the, the time. And uh, in the school, it was a headmaster, well, it was Mr. Petrie, who was the headmaster at that time. And David Oakes was a geography teacher in Yorkshire. And when he came up with children from the school, he would always pop into the school to see if there was maybe a job available. And he eventually got the job as geography teacher, and he was tremendous. Gillian, my daughter, was in one of his classes, and then he applied for the headmastership and, and got it. So, anything else, Wilma? There are bound to be lots. Any particular memory that you have, Mr. Perry, that... Of the school? Of Ian, well, any emotions or uh, Whiting Bay? When I moved to Whiting Bay, oh yes, uh, David was happy at... Uh, I wanted the one son and he was happy at school and uh, John MacDonald was 
thrown up and say, oh, I'm sorry, your son's got toothache today, is it all right, I'll send him to the dentist, you know, this kind of thing, personal touch, you know. David Perry and my son, Derek, Derek Miller, they were great pals. and Donald Kelso were in the same class, Oops, and they called them the three Ds. You sure? No, that's okay, I think that's me, thank you very much for taking part in this, thank you. I was going to show you this letter, a wee letter I got from uh, David Oakes. I tried to phone him. Everybody was saying that they couldn't find out the length of Whiting Bay. Oh, yeah, the pier. And he says here, I phoned you on Tuesday, but you couldn't make out who I was. That's because I'm so deaf. I had tried to find the length of Whiting Bay Pier, and although some information said it was the longest in the Clyde, and another said it was the longest in Scotland, there were no details of its length. I then contacted Donald Johnson, husband of Heather, the librarian, and owner of the shop, Lamlash Pier, who was very knowledgeable about the history of shipping, thinking he might know. He didn't know, but eventually he found a large-scale ordnance survey map of the 1920s. And listen to this clever bit. And by measuring the length of the pier on the map and using the scale of this map, he estimates the pier was at least 750 feet i.e. 250 yards long. Oh, that was just amazing. recently, one day last week he brought this in. Thank you very much. Because I had phoned four folk in the one night, folk like Archie Nickel, yeah, yeah. all we used to know, but we didn't know for the bottom. I used to run down that pier every Monday morning about seven o'clock after Joe had boiled an egg in the kettle where my tea was being made. In the kettle, and it was sometimes the burst in the kettle. Right. To get to Glasgow to, to college for nine o'clock. How long did the ferry take to get to Glasgow from? Oh, it was faster in those days. I could be in Glasgow by nine o'clock. And I think it left here at seven. Seven? Uh, yep. The death boat, they called uh, it. So they called it the death boat. Straight into Glasgow City straight Centre? Into, yeah. Where did they call that? On the Clyde? It didn't. It just went straight to Fairley. Sorry? Fairley. Um, in the winter, winter uh, months. And Adros. And it was a long pier too. And there was a train, of course, that took you into Central Station. And then I got the subway up to oh. Kelvin Grove. And you came back on the Friday night, did you? Sometimes, depending on the relationship. 